Thank you so much, Mike, for being here with us. And I, my pleasure. Especially under, you know, the circumstances, like it's admirable. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. And I should start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land on which McMaster University was built, traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and it's within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. So, hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ian Mackay. I'm the director of the Wilson Institute and organizer of this syndemic series. And this is about the origins and the ramifications of the contemporary COVID-19 pandemic. So for the details of our series, please see our website. It's a great pleasure tonight to introduce California-based geographer and historian, Mike Davis. And now I'll try and see if I can share my screen with you. And just to show you some of uh, Mike Davis's ast astonishing books. Mm -hmm. So here are just some of the amazing titles from Mike Davis over his many years of being, I would say one of the world's most important Marxist historians. We've got Prisoners of the American Dreaming, Planet of Slums, Late Victorian Holocaust, City of Quartz, and In Praise of Barbarians, just some of his major works. They were joined in 2018 by a book I'm reading right now, and it's, it's totally brilliant, uh, called Old Gods, New Enigmas, Marxist Lost Theory. It's a brilliant introduction to a Marx who stands a good chance of being eminently serviceable to the 21st century. More germane to our series are Mike's books on the global patterns of epidemic diseases uh, and here you see the two classic ones. In 2005, the monster at our door provided a disturbing, one review used the term shockingly realistic analysis of the genesis of avian flu and the vast agro-business complex created by global neoliberalism. This book carried the message regarded as unduly alarmist by some critics that unfettered capitalist accumulation was introducing humanity to an extended era of agro-business accelerated diseases. In 2020, it was reissued with the new introduction under a revealing new name, The Monster Enters. It's such an honor to have you with us, Mike, and uh, congratulations on all of this enormous productivity, which puts most of us to shame. Um, I'll be asking Mike some questions and then after that, the floor will be open to input from the audience. So my first question for you, Mike, is along with others working in the Marxist tradition, for instance, Bob Wallace and John Bellamy Foster, Andreas Malm, who will be joining us on May the 27th, you place special emphasis on the ways in which the present pandemic has been shaped by a corporate livestock revolution and third world urbanization elements in what many critical theorists have called the metabolic rift. In essence, metabolic rift maintains that capitalist development by despoiling the natural world is undermining not only its own preconditions, but menacing humanity's continued existence on the planet. And one theme raised by this emerging school is that the present pandemic and the general climate crisis are deeply interconnected, albeit in complicated ways. I was particularly struck by one passage in The Monster at Our Door from 2005. And this is, I quote, contemporary influenza like a postmodern novel has no single narrative, but rather disparate storylines racing one another to dictate a bloody conclusion. So I wanted to ask you what storylines in 2020, 2021 what storylines particularly strike you as good ones to pursue as we come to grips with the legacy of this quite different disease called COVID-19? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, the debt I owe to Rob Wallace uh, and his brilliant book on uh, big farms, big oh. 
And also to Jim O'Connor, the great California Marxist economist who really originated this idea of the metabolic rift. Before talking about the, um, the genesis and, and meaning of the current pandemic, I want to go back to something that I discussed at length in the original 2005 version of my book. And there's an incredible study that I quote by a large group of uh, researchers, scientists, I think it appeared in Nature. And what they show in absolutely extraordinary uh, detail is the chief factors that influence the emergence, the spread, and also the pathogenicity of uh, new diseases. And their account concerns West Africa. Now, traditionally, uh, coastal West Africa, which is the most urban, fastly urbanizing uh, place on the planet with the youngest population, derived its uh, protein largely from fishing. And there's a huge kind of artisan fishing industry in the Gulf of Guinea. But in the 1980s, 1990s, in this period, huge factory fleets from Spain and Japan, other parts of uh, Northwest Europe, rolled into the Gulf of Guinea. And they literally vacuumed up the fish stocks uh, something like two thirds of the fish protein was was literally uh, fished out, and this meant the both the decline and near destruction of parts of the native fishing industry, but it also meant uh, its fish prices rose in the cities and a huge shortage of uh, protein. At the very same time, multinational logging companies in uh, the the Congo and Cameroons, Gabon, uh, part of Nigeria, were logging out hardwood forests on an industrial scale. And in order to reduce their labor costs, they hired hunters uh, basically to kill anything in sight, some 60 to 70 uh, wild animals and reptiles, including primates. Uh, were put on the table in these logging camps. And what happened then is that this bushmeat, as it was called, found also an immediate market in the kind of protein deficient cities as a substitute for fish or, uh, in some cases, for chicken. And so increasingly bushmeat uh, found its way to the tables of people living in the slums of uh, the large West African cities. So you have here three different causalities. Uh, the ruthless mining out of uh, fish stocks in the Gulf of Guinea, the exploitation of uh, tropical uh, rainforests, and the destruction of the barrier that they provide between wild animal diseases and viral reservoirs uh, and the growth on absolutely almost exponential scale of informal and urban settlements lacking sanitation and potable water. Potable water, of course, is the most important medicine uh, that we have. So this was the, the perfect storm uh, conditions for the spread of Ebola, for HIV, and for God knows how many diseases uh, in the future. And the primary actors in this are, of course, international corporations and governments financed by regressive taxes who spend the minimum, if anything at all, on the provision of uh, health infrastructure, uh, you know, for their cities.
Uh, that's a great uh, way of sort of coming to grips with these many storylines, right? Because in, in that case, the storyline linking capitalist development to zoonotic diseases seems fairly straightforward. I'm not sure the storylines in COVID-19 have con congealed yet to the point where we can be, can be sure that the big, you know, the big farm creating the disease is really the one that's going to be paramount. Some people then might say, well, does that render the comparisons problematic? Because maybe the genesis of this disease is quite different. I mean, it might have, might have, might have had little to do with factory farming. But one blogger in China I'm following said, yeah, but that's, that's a red herring because you're actually missing the big picture, which is that this is an evolutionary pressure cooker in China that has evolved. And that really it's a pressure cooker of capitalist agriculture and urbanization. We'll find the precise links probably as the epidemiology matures on COVID. We'll, we'll get more and more data on how this actually happened. But I, you know, I was just wondering how you would respond to somebody who would say, well, this is a different, this seems like that's totally different script than the one of big farms cause big flu. Well, I mean, it would be easy enough to say that, look, you know, if there weren't the wet markets, the wild animal markets in China, you wouldn't have a direct transmission belt between wild viral reservoirs uh, and urban dwellers. Uh, or you can take the Trump approach and, you know, see behind this and, you know, a virus escaped from a laboratory, uh, a one in a million events. But the truth is this, that, you know, China, quite understandably, uh, with its uh, agricultural reforms, is rapidly expanding the intrusion of agriculture, both as state policy, but also simply as survival strategy by poor villagers into places like the rainforest of Sichuan, where presumably the COVID virus um, originated uh, amongst bats. Yeah. One thing we shouldn't forget is that when I spoke before about you know, HIV and Ebola. People really didn't see this coming. But COVID was anticipated uh, to an extraordinary degree after the outbreak of avian flu in 2003-04 in, uh, in Southeast Asia. People knew a pandemic was coming and they knew that the virus would originate uh, in contact between uh, animals sold as food items and particularly bats. Uh, so there was a major collaboration between a US NGO and the researchers at the Virology Institute in Wuhan. Uh, they've been down there for years exploring in the caves of Sichuan and discovered that bats, which of course the most numerous uh, mammal on the planet, some 1500 species, they identified something like 800 uh, different coronaviruses uh, that might be capable of emergence and uh, transmission. Their program was abruptly ended by uh, President Trump. There are 19 or 20 major reports in this country, Western Europe, the World Health Organization, all detailing the likely progress of, of the pandemic. The World Health Organization, which was supposedly the frontline defense, and this was accepted by treaty by the 130 or more countries signatory to the WHO. In the meantime, it became something of a hollow shell because countries didn't pay their contribution. The WHO became more and more dependent upon uh, the United States and China and also the Gates Fund uh, mm -hmm. Foundation uh, for its financing. And it had a structure where countries are given a veto over the public announcements and findings 
of uh, WHO. But if we might say that Ebola and HIV were kind of supply driven by the destruction of uh, natural barriers and, and poverty driving people to bush food items, in a sense what's happened with, with, with COVA, it's, it's demand driven. That is the major factor is the absence of primary health care in so many parts of the world, as well as the failure of even in advanced countries with national health systems to implement their own, uh, you know, previous planning uh, uh, for pandemics. And this has led to major institutional, major breakdowns of, inst of global institutions, uh, starting with WHO. But you look at the case of the European Union. Now, the European Union has a, uh, a pact. Uh, its member countries are responsible for their own healthcare systems. But it has a pact that in case of emergencies, whether those are, uh, you know, earthquakes or tsunamis, but also pandemic disease, it requires cooperation and mutual aid. Italy, which was the first major Western European country to be uh, affected by the pandemic, uh, evoked this uh, statutory obligation. And the response was immediately that France, Austria, other countries sealed the borders to Italy, refused to stop the export of supplies to Italy, and in the end, the only two countries that <clears throat> quickly responded to the Italian emergency were China, which sent uh, plane loads of experts and supplies, and uh, tiny little Cuba, which immediately sent doctors, uh, Cuban doctors being in the front lines of every major uh, uh, you know, epidemic. So even if you can't tie uh, the coronavirus emergence directly to factory farms in the way that you can with diseases carried by, uh, by uh, poultry or incubated in, you know, in pigs. The fact is that a generation of understanding and, and planning is totally discarded. And the pandemic was unleashed in a world in which essentially there are two immunological humanities. <laughs> uh, we can discuss this a little later. What is amazing to people who read your work and, and the work of the, in this school is how often the pandemic was not just sort of anticipated, but literally predicted. So right down to the end of 2009, people were sort of gaming out that, that they had scenarios at the official level of how how an epidemic was going to work and how the state should respond, so it's it's sort of a major moment in which the state has kind of failed uh, catastrophically. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, you declare in your, in your work that the next influenza epidemic is not it's not an if but a when it will hit us and potentially far more deadly effects. Than with this one and other people have, you know, bleakly declared the present pandemic our starter pandemic. You know, this is. <laughs> I I just wonder, as we're reaching what we hope is kind of the beginning of the end of this terrible moment. Do you think we should steal ourselves for a, a future of pandemic after pandemic after pandemic? I mean, is that a, a regional reasonable ex extrapolation from your work? Is that we're facing that kind of future and, and more concretely then what measures do you think states should take apart from just gaming this out and running scenarios that nobody pays any attention to or all, all these reports you mentioned too that gather dust in somebody's shelves. But it, I mean, that is the stupefying thing. Everyone could see this was coming and nobody did anything about it. Well, the silver lining of course was that one part of the preparation was successful. And this is direct result of the uh, incredible revolution that's been occurring in biodesign, uh, genetic design. Uh, 
So the basis existed, the knowledge existed, and in some cases even the candidate vaccines existed for the very rapid development of vaccines that specifically targeted uh, uh, COVID, but also potentially other vaccines. In fact, it's quite within the realm of possibility that with highly mutating viruses uh, uh, that um, it be, you know become our, our our scourge in terms of influenza and and COVID uh, RNA viruses, uh, where evolution has sped up millions of times faster than in more complex forms of life, that you can develop general or universal vaccines. Because what changes in these viruses as they, they mutate is, or mainly changes in uh, the head of uh, the surface protein, hemagglutinin in the case of, uh, uh, of influenza, and this is a highly variable, and, and this is where inevitably variations will appear uh, that can't be uh, uh, stopped by existing vaccines. But the real possibility of, of, of attacking the conserved regions of these surface proteins, uh, the so-called stock, and this is fully within reach and possible. But at the same time, it's it's dangerous because uh, if we put everything into uh, you know vaccines, we'll miss the the most important factor of all, which is the fact that so much of the world lives without primary health care, and even in the most advanced countries, particularly following the two thousand and eight economic crisis. Uh, even in rich countries, uh, public health and uh, primary care uh, have been totally eroded by uh, job cuts and uh, uh, you know lack of finance. In the United States, for example, sixty thousand public health care workers. I'm not talking about nurses and doctors. I'm talking about people who man the uh, local, often county level. Uh, public health service, 60,000 jobs were lost. They haven't been replaced. They weren't replaced. And similarly, you look at Britain and what's the cutbacks that have eviscerated the National Health Service and so on. Now, one of the most important debates in the history of modern public health was the debate about social medicine. And essentially, there were two camps by the turn of the 20th uh, by the early 20th century. On one hand, with a genealogy that goes back to the father of pathology, Rudolf Virchow, in Germany. Virchow had been at the barricades in 1848, laid an emphasis on primary health care rather than specific cures for specific uh, uh, diseases. And he believed, and his descendants believed, uh, that this also meant if you were going to provide adequate health care, you had to have major social change, raising wages, land reform, and so on. Now, the place for the idea of social medicine gained the most important purchase was in South America. And particularly, uh, say, take the case of uh, Chile in 1939, when there's a brief popular front government. Uh, its minister of public health was a young doctor who'd written extensively about this idea of social medicine. His name is Salvador Allende. And the social medicine ideal was also embraced by social democrats in Western Europe and uh, in the Soviet Union. But after the turn of the century, another school arose from the U.S. imperial experience uh, in the Caribbean and the Philippines, which was essentially a military assault on a specific uh, pathogen or that pathogen's major 
uh, vectors, that is the carriers of it, mosquitoes, in the first place. And when I was a kid in the 1950s, I mean, I gobbled up all these books about General Gorgas and the heroic people who stopped yellow f fever. This work was taken up by the Rockefeller Foundation. And in the period between the two wars, the Rockefeller Foundation was the major uh, uh, financier and, and coordinator of these disease-specific uh, campaigns. The kind of last stand at the social medicine school was at a WHO summit in Alma Alta, uh, in what's now Kazakhstan. Uh, in 1978-1979, and the Almaty Declaration declared that good health was a basic human right, and more or less endorsed the social medicine position. But that has lost ground, of course, with uh, the uh, dismantling of uh, the Soviet bloc and also with the growing power of uh, Big Pharma, which, of course, uh, endorses the view that uh, hugely expensive government uh, subsidize, uh, you know, vaccines are really the only uh, way to go. So without discounting the importance of searching for new vaccines, particularly universal vaccines, which have come within our reach yeah. over the last five or 10 years. I believe the fundamental question in terms of world public health remains the questions posed by uh, the social medicine uh, uh, movement. I might just comment parenthetically that in Canada, where we have a, a partial, partial system of public health, the reason why we have at least some element of what you say in the United States, you know, single payer. Uh, the reason why we have something progressive in our health system goes back to people who were inspired by the Soviet example in the 20s and 30s and this quite revolutionary idea of public health. But this sort of leads me on to the next question is that there seems to be a fundamental philosophical problem for neoliberals who don't like the expense of state and in many ways don't even like the idea of the public uh, as a, an entity that has interests and should or collect a collectivity that should be cared for. There's a kind of sense in which this is a crisis for global neoliberalism and its way of thinking about the state and the way of thinking about humanity in general. I, 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 I sometimes think this might be the last nail on the coffin of neoliberalism as a plausible ideology. But then whenever I think that, I also say, yeah, but consider how deeply this has sunk into the psyches of everybody who's been exposed to it in the last 40 years. But I noticed that you write, a year from now, we may look back in admiration at China's success in containing the pandemic, but in horror at the United States failure. And I wonder if that just doesn't tie into, well, both the business imperatives that drive so much American policy, but also just the, the difficulty neoliberals have in conceiving of anything that goes, anything that transcends the profit motive and the interests of business. They're really, they've, they've sort of pushed this experiment, this philosophical experiment of theirs to the point of destruction. Do you see uh, alignment there with, or does that, do you think we're, we're seeing the, a nail in neoliberalism's coffin or am I, is that uh, premature? Only if we have the hammer <laughs> and are prepared to keep driving it in relentlessly. I mean, there's neoliberalism and neoliberalism. And in fact, most neoliberals, particularly in, you know, represented by New Labour, the establishment, uh, the Democratic Party establishment here and centrist regimes, um, the, the German conservatives, conservative parties, don't discount the role of the state. They realize that different kinds of uh, state provided externalities Right. are essential to a program of privatization and, you know, extending the, the contours for uh, accumulation. Uh, and also 
the capital itself will always find profit opportunities in disasters, even those that it's brought about themselves. I mean, look at the United States. I mean, Amazon has emerged as this Leviathan, you know, over the bodies of hundreds of thousands of dead uh, small businessmen. The insurance companies are raking in the biggest profits uh, in history in this country. Big Pharma uh, has been given the profits for virus for antiviral vaccines, which have been paid for by the American public and most of the research done in public universities. So uh, COVID, at least here in the United States, has been a bonanza for different sectors of, of capital, which look forward to an expansion of healthcare uh, and to coming pandemics <laughs> as, as important, uh, important profit uh, points. But what happened here is, is, of course, different in one way uh, from anywhere else except uh, uh, for Bolsonaro's Brazil. And that is where the state takes an active role in disorganizing the pandemic response, where it becomes a major vector of the pandemic itself, which has yielded, of course, incalculable uh, consequences, you know, now measured in what's fast approaching 600,000 dead in these countries. That's right. Now, it's not simply a partisan matter. And if you look at states like New York and California, Democrats are completely culpable for massacres in senior homes, for the fate of uh, low wage workers unprotected in essential industries. In Southern California, for instance, uh, two thirds of people who died from COVID uh, are Latinos working in low wage industries and living in congested. Uh, housing, likewise, with, with farm workers. But the United States and Brazil are absolutely uh, uh, examples of an almost uh, fas fascist approach uh, to disease. I shouldn't say that. Actually, Nazis probably would have mounted, uh, you know, a you know, quite comprehensive effort to protect Aryan, uh, uh, Aryan lives. And it's my belief, not surprising, that the Republican Party has become the party of global death. It's been the major uh, opposition to any kind of effective action about climate change. And it's now assured hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths and uh, more in the future. I, I tried to argue vigorously in the pages of the nation that we shouldn't be worrying so much about uh, a national inquiry into what happened on January 6th when far right took over the invaded the Congress, but more on the culpability of those responsible for allowing the pandemic, first of all, to get out of control, and then secondly, attacking, disorganizing, demonizing the necessary public health uh, measures uh, uh, to say it. This is, you know, this is murder. Uh, first, second, third degree, I don't know what, but it is, you know, murder in that most of the deaths have been pointed out by studies in the Lancet and even by, uh, now by members of the Biden administration were preventable and, uh, and unnecessary. Now, finally, to, to, to the larger question, which is really can globalized neoliberalism, uh, accumulation on a world scale through division of labor uh, that exports most uh, productive jobs uh, to relatively low wage nations, whether this can continue without a serious infrastructure of global public health, uh, and control over the transmission of disease through, you know, air travel and and trade. 
Now, this is an open question. I don't put, I, I would say from the standpoint of logical capitalism, this would be absolutely necessary. But we never actually deal with logical uh, uh, capitalism. And the current chaos in, in the European Union and all the initial disasters followed by second and third waves of the pandemic and the fiasco of the vaccination campaign on, you know, on the continent. Uh, she raised some big questions whether capital independently organized or acting through the state can uh, really address this uh, emergency, even while parts of it find you know, uh, pandemics and plagues, uh, uh, you know, very, very new ways to engage in neoliberal uh, <laughs> uh, appropriation of wealth. I'd like to go back to your idea of there being two distinct humanities immunologically and, and you're saying this sort of what you've said about murder, you know, recalling Frederick Engels writing in Manchester in the 1840s about social murder. And he says, you know, even though it, it's happening without any one sort of individual murdering anybody, it is still kind of a, a social murder. It's a willful abdication of responsibility for the lives of other people. I'm wondering too about uh, the pattern we see in India, whether it doesn't recall a lot of the things you uncovered in uh, your book on late Victorian Holocaust about how you know, the whole Indian economy was basically made subservient to that of the, the needs of the British Empire, so that while you had famines in, in India, that, you know, you still had uh, exports to Britain of, of things that, you know, the population needed. And it seems uncannily echoed today with India's you know, vaccination, a vaccine powerhouse, but essentially can't vaccinate its, you know, it's really struggling to vaccinate its own people. And that's one reason why the pandemic is getting out of control. I guess the general question I'm asking is, would you think that uh, class analysis and analysis of imperialism and empire, which I think pretty much through much of the academy was put in the shadows and said, you know, that that's, that's, old, that's old left stuff, don't worry about it. Hasn't that come back uh, with enormous strength in 2020? Maybe Marxists will celebrate 2020 as a moment in which class analysis and the analysis, the critical analysis of empire came back squarely to center stage and, you know, not only changing academic life, one hopes, but also much more importantly, the world of progressive politics beyond the academy. Is that an overly optimistic <laughs> analysis? Perhaps. <laughs> um, there's very little to celebrate in uh today's world yeah now but i do notice people are talking a lot more about class divisions true but you know we have to translate that into uh real politics right. real politics that has the ability um uh, to reach grassroots people ordinary uh working people now india apart from the great artificial famines of the 1870s the 1890s is where the majority of people killed by the 1918, 1919 so-called Spanish flu. Although some historians argue it would be better called the Kansas flu. Kansas flu. <laughs> yeah. It was, was first detected. Um, some 20, 25 million uh, Indians died. And this is, again, an important uh, uh, case study for understanding uh, the interaction between disease, capital, and in this case, the imperial state. Because what happened in India is that uh, the British torqued up during the First World War, uh, the requisition of grain and all kinds of other raw materials and supplies from India uh, it, to support the Indian army. Uh, which was fighting the the Ottoman Empire, and of course Britain on the on the Western Front. This coincided with a drought and widespread 
uh, crop failure. So when the H1N1, the original one, uh, disembarked from his ship uh, in Bombay, millions of Indians were malnourished, already sick. There was also cholera. And they were absolutely decimated. And the British response was almost nothing, uh, neg negligible, uh, you know, at the best. Today in India, we see a model of growth that has produced, uh, you know, spectacular, spectacularly looking 21st century surrounded by, you know, immense belts of, 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 of slums and in misery. We're still, most women in the Indian countryside and in many cities still have to defecate in the open where potable water is often uh, uh, not available. So India has kind of uh, subsumed within itself this division between immunological humanities. That is, on one side, there are people who live in societies like us, where the people, and remember immunology determines uh, so much of, of the pattern and the lethality of, of any pandemic. But we live in societies where it's, it's, it's the old and the poor, uh, the people living in congested housing, immigrant populations, Native Americans, and so on. Maybe about a quarter to a third of the population who suffer from pre-existing conditions associated with enhanced mortality. But in other, other places, like in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, majority of people suffer from compromised immune systems because of the lack of potable water, because of malnutrition, uh, because of exposure to all kinds of toxic and environmental factors and so on. Now in India, we, we see these two worlds together, you know, a newly enlarged, fairly massive middle class, some of whom live in essentially American subdivisions outside, you know, uh, you know, within high tech cities, but the majority of the population lacking access to uh, basically to basic primary care potable water, and so on. And you see what's happened in India is that that first Indian humanity has been saved, while well, the other has been neglected or condemned uh, to pandemic, which is not only continuing to roar out of control, but remember that if you allow uh, viruses, uh, RNA viruses, kind of free reign, to spread in larger and larger uh, populations. This increases the evolutionary space uh, for these viruses to develop, you know, new and more deadly uh, mutants. And of course, we've seen this uh, happen. I mean, California has its own, you know, deadlier strain, more transmissible strain. And we've seen what's happened in Britain mm. and Brazil. And now in India, and here's where the fundamental break in human solidarity uh, occurs. In India, the you know the rich run to the clinics, and uh, the vaccine depot has been on, on on a global scale. The wealthy countries save each other, and pharmaceutical companies reap vast fortunes. But the larger part of humanity uh, is totally left behind. And again, it's not only a matter of vaccine, it's the conditions that compromise immunity and, uh, and health and living conditions, uh, which in many ways grow uh, worse every year. And as the UN, of course, has noted that it's 21 key development goals, uh, many of them 
have now been reversed. You know, goals of reducing child poverty and raising income and better health education for uh, women. This is in some ways like the 1970s, were crushed under debt, uh, uh, Latin American, African countries, uh, suffered enormous losses in, in uh, income and, and health and educational standards. Yeah. This is happening now, and it's uh, pre so in, some, in some ways, a, a radical left should demand genuine public health on a global level, and you know, and raising the question of Brazil or India. I mean, how how can those countries, if you're if even if you're a hard nosed neoliberal, how could you possibly quarantine those countries in a world that you have globalized? You know, you, we've been told for forty years the world is flat. We should level tariff barriers. We should, you know, free movement of capital, although not so much of working class people. But uh, the idea is that you know we will remove all of these barriers. Well, how can a neoliberal then turn around and say we're going to quarantine India or Brazil? Well, if if you don't if you can't do that, then surely the next step, logical step is to say, well, we have to have some sort of global regime of public health that can enforce and not just sort of lamely like as you were pointing out, Hugh, you know, WHO was was sort of reduced in its stature. You'd actually have to have some kind of world authority that could actually prevail upon recalcitrant governments and force force them to do what the world requires. Well, um, let me just repeat two earlier points. One is that it was the analysis of the social medicine tradition that healthcare as a human right requires radical socioeconomic reforms, strong unions, the raising of incomes, agrarian uh, reform. The other point is that there is no longer a pivot in the world, a kind of Archimedean point for human solidarity and unity. See, one thing the Cold War did is made every single inch of the earth valuable. Um, you know, if a small group of people, you know, a tribal society decided they wanted to listen to Radio Moscow, well, you know, the Americans were there a second uh, later. And both sides were, were the, the U.S. side of the Cold War was forced to respond to the Soviet Union's uh, anti-colonialism and internationalism with its own vision of world progress. Uh, so you had the Alliance for Progress, you know, battling five-year plans across the planet. When the Cold War ended, any kind of disco, real serious discourse about human development and progress as a whole was abandoned. And of course, neoliberalism uh, has dug that grave deeper and deeper. So you have to look in the world how would we bring about the kind of international uh, social reforms that are necessary? How can you really build these international uh, infrastructures for welfare and public health out of existing uh, countries today? And again, remember that even if suddenly uh, vaccines were universally available, everywhere, that would still leave the larger problem in place, which is such a large portion of humanity basically standing in front of the headlights uh, of the next pandemic. Something that I've spent a lot of time polemicizing about in the last year or two has been the fact that while Amer the United States has really been the exception to the rule of the general forward march and successive victories of far-right parties every, everywhere. I mean, it's obviously Trump's our mega version of this. But in other cases, it's because social democracy, or the British Labour Party kind of collapsed in, in front of this. Where in the United States, there's this incredible resurgence of social democracy or left ideas. 
particularly amongst the younger generation. Generation Z, the one that my younger children who are still in high school belong to, by every poll and measurement, uh, some form of socialism wins out over uh, you know, capitalism any day of the week. This is an enormous development. Yeah. But the emergence of this new, new left has created a kind of version of a left-wing version of America firstism. And that was on full exhibit during the Democratic primary debates when Bernie Sanders only marginally touched on uh, international issues and, and likewise uh, Elizabeth Warren. So, you know, we suffer from uh, a deficit of internationalism, which is why I can't help but, uh, but be fond of the Argentine soccer fan currently inhabiting the biggest house in Rome. Because he's virtually the only world leader uh, to stand up and insist on human solidarity and the unity of the human species in almost every speech he makes. I noticed in old gods do enigmas you hold up while well, you ask the question, to what extent does the infirmal proletariat, the most rapidly growing global class, possess the most potent of Marxist talismans, historical agency? And there I, I, you're asking the question, can we imagine another historical agent other than the old left hope was the proletariat and, and you know trade unions, communist parties, to appoint social democratic parties could all, they would be moving history forward. Since 1989, that's become less plausible, but is there a hope for, you mentioned young people and also maybe the people of the planet, the planet of slums, we can, there, there can be ways in which this pandemic can mobilize people, maybe just by showing them that the drastic costs of capitalism unleashed. Well, we've seen the new vanguard of the proletariat in action uh, over the last year uh, I, because of various ailments have spent an inordinate amount of time uh, in hospitals and clinics over the last five years. And look, you know, a big HMO, big hospital. People are punching in the clock the same way people did into Ford factories or coal mines. But they're in some ways far more educated and conscious. And everything about the work that nurses, hospital workers of all kinds uh, do, other people in essential services, you know, confronts them daily with the contradictions and failure of private sector organized um, medicine and the government uh, directed against uh, public welfare. And it's no surprise then that the major union to support Bernie Sanders, and arguably the most militant union in the United States right now, is the National Union of, uh, of, of Nurses. And I do believe the pandemic uh, across the world has radicalized health workers huh. with nurses often being uh, in the vanguard. I think that's true for the National Health Service and uh, Britain as well, and, and likely for other countries. We shouldn't forget oh, that, and this is something I've, I've left out of the discussion so far, that a successful public health approach depends on popular mobilization involvement from the grassroots level. So for instance, in Vietnam, which is still only, and you know, it's considered median income, but a poor country by our, mm -hmm. by our standards, has had an astonishing success, success in avoiding death on a large scale and containing it. Uh, one reason is that it has a medical elite uh, with global stature because of its experiences fighting, uh, you know, previous diseases like SARS and uh, uh, avian flu. But it also has a paramedical system reaching down to the, you know, the village a lot to paramedical workers and village uh, 
uh, uh, nurses and some aggressive campaign of uh, public health uh, education. I mean, this doesn't exonerate the lack of, uh, uh, of democracy at the highest levels in that society. But it shows how absolutely important public participation is. I recently blurbed a, a book by some Chinese new leftists based on interviews with people and experiences in Wuhan. And although the existence of a mass communist party, which extends its tendrils down to, you know, every apartment building and so on, played a crucial role in mobilization, much of what happened actually didn't occur through party channels. It occurred through popular organization, including, you know, swinging critiques of the initial cover-up by the, uh, uh, you know, by the government, the Hubei government, and, you know, especially the pandemics. You created these networks of uh, popular self-help and uh, uh, resistance. And this really hasn't been measured or adequately, adequately uh, reported in most accounts of the pandemic. The, the centrality of a popular role and the need for, you know, grassroots net, networks of uh, public health medicine. In fact, when you look at the whole issue of public health education, when you look at the United States, I mean, a hardcore 40% of the U.S. population, absolutely every poll, the same 40% that diehard Trump supporters are also diehard denied pandemic denialists. We, we you know, regard the uh, little reading in the Bible is, is far truer than, you know, any biology uh, 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 book. So here in supposedly one of you know, the most advanced scientific country in the world, the degree of ignorance about basic science yeah. and the reign of religious superstition is just simply a staggering fact. I mean, in some ways that can be connected to neoliberalism's abandonment of any notion of responsibility to the people is that you have no responsibility to educate the people to whom you're supposedly answerable. So it, it, in some ways, perspectives, it's fine to keep people fairly ignorant and superstitious as long as they show up for work. We were, what's the problem? I mean, maybe I'm being cynical, but I, I think there is a real way in which the neoliberal state entailed the abandonment of, you know, what Thomas Hobbes would have said was the primary responsibility of a government, which is to keep its people alive, basically, and protect them from each other, right? It's not, a, not exactly a Marxist message, it's sort of almost more basic than that, is that what, why, why do we have a government? Um, um, what does its legitimacy rest? Well, a long standing argument is, well, at least it keeps us alive. Well, these governments have not been doing that. They, they, you know, neoliberal governments almost universally have failed in that, that enterprise. It seems- Well, I, you know, I much agree with the interpretation that says that we've entered a phase of apocalyptic capitalism, uh, unable to prevent climate change, decarbonize the planet, provide universal uh, public health, uh, the global branded economy uh, no longer creates jobs, right. uh, which leads to an interesting Marxist uh, paradox. <laughs> and one of the major problems in the world is capitalism exploiting us. It regards us as uh, supernumerary surplus requirements of, 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 of profit mating. Majority of the populations of Africa and Latin America, uh, Latin America, the most urbanized of, of continents, uh, toil in the informal economy. The formal economy hasn't created, you know, you know, net jobs for years and years. Uh, and of course, waiting in the distance, how far we don't know, maybe much closer than we uh, suspect. Uh, 
is the fact that nothing's been done to reduce the danger of nuclear war, particularly in some regional yeah. uh, circumstance. Uh, we've seen more Bay of Pigs, like Bay of Pig incidents, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis incidents, like it could twice now between India uh, and, and Pakistan. So in ensuring its own reproduction and survival, capitalism ensures a future of extinction for at least a large minority of the human race, particularly that part that's no longer uh, requisite to its own, uh, you know, its own reproduction. And since the ending of the Cold War and any kind of uh, universalist uh, a discourse, we kind of accept this in our daily lives. We kind of accept it. Millions of poor people are going to die. And it's becoming naturalized in the same way that homelessness has been in this country. Uh, my kids don't believe me when I tell them that I, you know, I, when I was a young adult, there was no homelessness in California. It's not like a natural fact, and because of that, it's invisible and, and seen as in, insolvable. I mean, a triage of humanity uh, is in place. Yeah. And that fact needs, to, I think, to guide and direct uh, all of our thoughts and uh, emotions and, above all, uh, our activism. That's a great segue to my last question, which is when you updated the monster at our door in, of 2005 and you made it the monster enters in 2020, you wrote that uh, you had to order in a copy of your own book because, and you write, quote, unconsciously, I wanted it off my bookshelf in order to exorcise the anxiety involved in its writing. And that made me think, well, this has been a, an extraordinarily terrible year for people of bereavement, of suffering, depression, you know, mounting cases of deaths of despair through opioid addiction. And people are just seeking some escape or solace in what has been a, an extremely dark and troubling year for them. Sometimes I wonder if Marxists like me uh, run the risk as we're itemizing these things of itemizing the perils of humanity. Why do we run the risk of adding a kind of, adding our own little bit to an apocalyptic culture of despair? And in many ways contributing to sort of this collapsology that the French talk about of, you know, this kind of study of almost enjoyment of the idea of human collapse, the, the abandonment of, of humanism. I wonder if we don't run the risk of adding to that uh, by our, analyses in a sense. And yet, in a sense, you know, I, I don't really know that I have an easy answer to this. I'm just wondering if, can we go, can we supplement our gloomy prognosis of, of all these enormous contradictions to generate something more inspiring for people, which surely a new global left will require is kind of a, a higher hope, a realistic hope to aim for. Well, I'm quite notorious on this point and that I don't actually believe that hope uh, is either a requirement of radical writing or is it a scientific concept. Uh, I think the obligation that I have and others have is to write as accurately and realistically as uh, we can about uh, the current crisis. People fight because it is their way to realize their humanity, to defend their families and communities and, and class. People face the dark ages and they give resistance in return. Uh, the whole idea that, uh, you know, you join the struggle for as long as, you know, it seems like it might win, but when it's obvious it died, well, then, you know, go on to other things. I mean, this has happened <coughs> a lot in history. 
but it's not the attitude of the Paris Commune and 18 year old Russian soldiers in Stalingrad. Uh, I'm very old school uh, about this. And I suppose I'm very Brechtian about it because Brecht's poems and writings uh, in the late 30s and uh, the 1940s had enormous influence in me, uh, you know, when I was younger. And we need, you know, we need to be ruthlessly honest about what we face and what we, uh, you know, what our obligations are. I mean, in terms of socialism, well, I'm a socialist the same way Billy Graham was a Baptist. Um, I believe that uh, it's the hope of the world. But we've lost an awful lot of ground, uh, uh, you know, historically. On a personal level, I'll contradict myself and say I am hopeful because I have two kids still in high school. I have an older daughter who's in Belfast, where she was born. Uh, my kids are fierce uh, fighters. They look ahead very, very clearly. They were active in the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and so on. And I'm, uh, my younger kids, by the way, are Mexican. Their, their mother's Mexican. Go to inner city high school. And it was amazing to me to see the kids in this high school. I'm not talking about rarities like my kids growing up in a middle-class left-wing home with millions of books, but their friends who were working-class Latino immigrants, Somalis, African-Americans, just ordinary kids. The way they banded together and just erupted uh, last spring and summer in the Black Lives Matter protest was astonishing to me. This is a generation of tigers and lions, maybe is better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the better term. I mean, the problem in this country is a huge mass base for radical politics, but there is no national organization, including Democratic Socialist America, which I don't belong to, but most of my, uh, you know, friends do. That really gives any kind of leadership. Uh, or strategy to the movements, to certain elementary questions of 100, even 150 years ago, uh, about what is to be done, uh, yeah. still, still need to be, uh, still need to be answered. <laughs> well, maybe I'll I'll uh, turn it over to our audience now. We we'll probably have some questions. Wait. Yeah, they're they're all able to. Unmute so now themselves. I can unmute them. You just add, they can unmute themselves. Okay, so if you want to un unmute yourself and ask, uh, raise your you raise your hands that uh, if you know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> there's a command under. I think it's under participants, reactions. or maybe it's no, it's under reactions where you can raise your hand. So. I'm seeing a hand raised by Eric McPherson. Eric. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, appreciate that talk, Mike. Um, the question I have is I, I like that you brought up the nurses and healthcare workers, um, but I can't help but think that in Canada, at least, it's illegal for uh, nurses to go on strike or other healthcare workers. So, what advice or uh, perspective would you have on organizing uh, healthcare workers for more radical forms of, I don't know, labor protests, one might say? Well, quite honestly, I mean, uh, I and most other people I know have loads to learn from healthcare workers mm -hmm. uh, and, and their struggles. I mean, this is a constantly enriched experience now, labor movements in North America, on both sides uh, of the water, uh, have always worked under legal disabilities. 
reactionary Supreme Courts, anti-strike laws, uh, states of emergency, and so on. And the traditional answer, not from the left, but even from, you know, like right-wing leadership, the American Federation of Labor before the 1930s, was no right to strike? Strike. <laughs> Told not to go out in the streets and protest? Put your mask on, go out in the streets and 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 protest. If strikes become impossible, job actions uh, of all kinds. I mean, really, our forebears in, in the, the union movements in North America uh, labored for the longest period without the support of the states and with the opposition of the highest judicial uh, authorities. We have to reclaim that. I mean, one thing that happened in this country was that there was one long break in the general conservative and employer domination of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this was the Warren Court in its extension into the 1970s. And so the civil rights movement, that part of it represented by the NAACP and, you know, and Martin Luther King to some extent, is actually more radical, kind of contoured the whole civil rights strategy to winning the support of Supreme Court decisions and then forcing legislature uh, by Congress. So the generation I grew up in and the generation that follows is thinking the Supreme Court is our allies. Now we're just back to the status quo ante, what's generally been the case which is in this country a uh, Supreme Court that's wholly uh, in its majority reactionary. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. Ah, Lindsay Allison. Hello. Um, thank you for the, uh, am I, uh, oh, sorry, wrong camera. Um, <laughs> I have two cameras. Um, so I, uh, I mean, I, I work in finance, which means I know nothing about this stuff, but I do have a spouse who works in healthcare and she's worked in a, in a really fascinating, she works in a, in a hospital, major hospital here in Toronto. It's been an absolutely fascinating journey hearing about, I mean, it's horrific, but uh, at the same time, it's very interesting hearing about her perspectives on the sort of patients that they see. And it's changed, the dynamics have changed literally in the last three weeks or so. But before that, she was saying that, you know, age is clearly the most important determinant in who ends up in hospital at the time. But she was also saying there's a very, and it's, this is anecdotal. So I need, and, and the stat, I'm sure there'll be stats later on and all this sort of stuff is strictly anecdotal, but she said it's in many ways, one of the most horrific diseases in terms of the comorbidities that were coming with it. Um, so the people who were landing in, in hospital, I mean, they weren't just the 80 plusers. It was the, and that's, you know, that that's terrible in and of itself, but it was also people with hypertension, diabetes, and all the comorbid comorbidities that you can see a list of. And I often thought that it wasn't just the it wasn't the middle class, you know, folks like me that sit in their office all day, you know, we would be in, you know, uh, we would definitely be in with a big target on, I always thought that I was, you know, clearly in danger, except I have the good fortune to be able to work from home. And the only, I don't see anybody, <laughs> um, which is a bit of a blessing for everyone else around me, I suppose. But I guess my question to you is to what extent going forward, uh, has, do you think that the general health of uh, you know the, the whole nation, not just segments of the nation, will play a role in um, combating not just COVID, which, from what I've read and what I understand, people are saying it's basically here to stay. It's not going anywhere anytime soon, regardless of how you know the vaccines roll out. Um, to what extent is you know and and targeting the general health of the nation, you know, kind of a, an optimal social policy. Well, of course, uh, epidemic disease always follows the contours of inequality and, uh, and poverty. 
but the current in this country was also driven by an administration that sabotaged every effort to protect people at the workplace. Now, here within the Department of Labor, uh, we have the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, which is supposed to protect uh, workers at peril in various kinds of situations, uh, you know, miners, agriculture workers, so on. There were hundreds of complaints filed with this agency by meatpacking workers, farm workers, uh, other kinds of uh, essential workers. And OSHA, as it's called, under Trump, refused to process any of these. It refused to enact uh, uh, any any fines or process grievances in any employers. In other words, it, it deliberately allowed uh, the pandemic to spread through a workforce, a largely minimum wage uh, 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 workforce, a lot of people with existing comorbidities, as, as you uh, uh, say, and the results, you know, was the slaughter, only surpassed by the massacre in nursing homes. Now, this occurred in not only the United States, to some extent in your country, mm -hmm. certainly in Britain and other places in Europe where uh, seniors, you know, who are convalescent or uh, too sick uh, to take care of themselves in any, any fashion. Uh, are housed in a in a private system, which is in the United States, largely owned by hedge funds, and egregiously in violation uh, for years. Uh, minimal standards of sanitation, training, and uh, disease prevention. Now, last year I, I had a um, uh, I issued a daily mailing of articles and comments on the pandemic starting in March and uh, taking stuff from <clears throat> scientific journals and sometimes my own editorials. The first thing I published was from a friend of mine who is the union rep for the nursing home employees in Kirkland, Washington, a nursing home chain owned by one of the most notorious of these piratical uh, uh, companies. And he pointed out, and remember, this is the very beginning of takeoff of the pandemic. Then county health em employees, which were shut out at the home at the very beginning, uh, when they finally entered, uh, nobody was asking questions about uh, the staff in these homes. Nobody seemed to recognize that people are so badly paid that they often moonlight in a second job in another nursing home. And he said, so what's going to happen is it's going to spread like wildfire through the entire system from coast uh, to coast. This was entirely foreseen. He was absolutely right uh, down to the details. And basically nothing, nothing happened again. Regulation failed, there were no fines. This was true in some cases of uh, state public health agencies in democratic states. And about 40% of the people who died in the United States were seniors, most of them because of neglect, the failure of state regulation. Uh, and the fact that this has occurred in a variety of, of, of countries, uh, this is nothing but you know, but absolutely criminal. And of course, it suggests the need for an entirely different uh, system of taking care of the, uh, the sick elderly. I know in, in, in Canada, this has been one of our major issues and they even sent the army in at one point to the nursing homes of Ontario. And they, the, the soldiers found the conditions so horrific. Some of them have had to have PTSD 
therapy afterwards because it is just it, it just went beyond belief what was allowed to go on in such institutions in Canada. I'm, I'm just hoping that the perception of that outrage, our rage about it, our, our refusal to accept it can be preserved through a time of bereavement and shock and all the other things we're going through. But we have somehow have to struggle to preserve just the, sh the shock of, of disbelief of those soldiers entering nursing homes and being almost overwhelmed by the horror of what they were seeing. I think we need to retain that somehow uh, so that we just don't, you know, we don't sort of close the door on this uh, pandemic and say, well, thank goodness that's over, back to normal. The normal caused this problem. <laughs> No, I, I I should mention a kind of personal experience here, which is that m my mother, after my father was a member of the Meat Cutters Union, and uh, he ended up losing um, his pension plan, and my mother went back to work as an aide in a nursing home, and I can't tell you how many nights she had to call my father to come to the nursing home to help her pick up an elderly patient who fell out of their bed, sometimes breaking bones, lying in their own urine and, you know, in feces, clean them and put them back. Because the people who ran the nursing home uh, refused to add more, uh, uh, you know, night shift workers. And, you know, these people could have been in concentration camps for all that. and. Uh, my mother is a very feisty Irish woman. Uh, you know, it's just completely full of, uh, you know, of rage at seeing this happen day after day. So this has been the case for a very long time. We have to get rid of a for-profit uh, nursing home industry and replace it with something public, decent and safe. Seeing a question from Evan Ubini. Evan? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, one thing you mentioned was how you were saying your kids don't believe you when you say there didn't used to be homeless people in California. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering if you think there's any like main uh, cause or factor that you attribute like the demise of like labor and the welfare state that happened around the 80s where we saw this private privatization happen like i i, I kind of wonder this because i feel like if there's there's no homelessness why would people be driven to change the policies that were in place then well as old as i am i've watched the evolution of homelessness and the ecology of homelessness through um, its different phases. In the beginning, it was the shutting down of state mental hospitals and the idea that uh, people would find jobs and shelter in their community. There would be this investment in community centers. You would create a far more humane system. Uh, well, nursing homes were shut down. People were forced out, but there wasn't the investment in uh, either shelters or uh, mental health facilities. And it wasn't too long before our jail systems became the major mental ins institutions for the mentally ill in the state. But homelessness has changed over time. Right now, what is so striking is how many people are homeless and homeless is family groups, including children, who don't fall into the categories of um, addiction or mental illness or being dumped in the streets by the prison system. They're simply to house. This, a few days ago, it was announced that California, for the first time in history, had lost population. I mean, this state has been in a continuous boom since I was born here in 1946 through my entire life. This is a historical watershed. And why is the population declining? Because huge numbers of working class people, low wage people, are fleeing the state. 
they can't afford uh, shelter. And now you're seeing this everywhere uh, on the streets. And it's just a, a screaming indictment day by day of the humanity of this and the fact that the housing crisis to, in order to be resolved, it won't be resolved by private sector, which builds mansions. It doesn't build affordable uh, housing. It builds second homes and fire prone uh, forest areas and so on. It doesn't provide uh, starter shelter for elementary school teachers or, or service workers. You have to attack the system of private property which of course is, uh, you know, been possible under capitalism to some degree. I mean, when I lived in London for years, I was always struck by the fact that in the wealthiest neighborhoods in Europe, you could still find uh, council housing projects brought by the uh, victory of the labor government in 1945. Uh, uh, you know, you know, in Canada, it's not unusual not only to find that football teams are generally owned by uh, 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 cities, not by private owners, but also Canadian cities control development at the fringe. Uh, and in my writing, I tried to stress that issues of gentrification and unhousing are insolvable unless you address the root cause of land inflation and speculation. You need to remove large parts of the city, uh, rescue it from land inflation. We need public housing. We need massive amounts of affordable housing that can't be built unless you control and stop uh, the ever-rising uh, prices of land. Now, my authority in all this is not Karl Marx, by the way. It's the most influential uh, radical thinker of the late 19th century in the United States, uh, Scotland, Ireland. I'm sure he had a big following in Canada as well, Henry George. He pointed to the root cause of, of California's contradictions uh, were land speculation and land profiteering. And he proposed that basically you would tax away all gains in, in land value. People would own the, the, the real property, the house they built. The land essentially would be uh, a socialized and uh, one of the things that's kind of exciting right now is that questions which formerly had been far beyond the horizon of even the most progressive politics suddenly now have wide audiences. Uh, what I guess Trotsky called transitional uh, demands that don't require the abolition of capitalism but are incompatible uh, with traditional practices of the, uh, you know, the profit making. And until you have the will and have mobilized the support to interfere in the land market and democratize uh, urbanization, or at least an important part of it, and also control uh, uh, sprawl, all attempts to prevent uh, gentrification and the expulsion of people from cities will ultimately be uh, uh, unsuccessful. In fact, one thing that, for instance, saving neighborhoods and you know environmental amenities does is just simply make them attractive to people with more money, and then price out the original uh, uh, the original inhabitants. Yeah. Uh, unless there are any more uh, questions for Mike, I, I think um, we've had a wonderful session and I, I'm really uh, hugely grateful to you for this.
Uh, it's a tremendous honor for us to have hosted you. I hope someday you maybe we can do it non-virtually and <laughs> have you really here in Hamilton, which is, I think, a city you'd like. It's a very, you know, a city with a very strong working class history of labor organization, of, of tremendous struggles. And, uh, and I think some, in some ways that spirit still is here in Hamilton. So if you ever get a chance, uh, do come up and we'll, we'll do this in person. In fact, I have Ontarian uh, roots. My, <laughs> my, my grandfather, Jack Ryan, born in Ontario, across the river to uh, Detroit in the 1890s to uh, enlist in the American army in the conquest of, uh, uh, you know, the Spanish empire. So, uh, you know, I have, may have relatives around Hamilton. I also taught at Carleton in New York. Did you? Oh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I had a work permit and uh, <laughs> the whole whole thing. Well, you've, you've so, made Thank, thanks to, to, to all of you and best of luck with uh, your series. And thank you again so much for, for coming. Thank you everyone for showing up.